But who you really want to applaud now is our next speaker, and the person is Eric Niebler. Eric is a senior manager at Facebook and an active member of the ISO C++ standardization committee. He's the principal author of the upcoming Rangers TS and of the Range V3 library, on which it is based. Before Facebook, Eric consulted independently and with Boost Pro Computing. He has authored several Boost libraries and served as a Boost release manager and a member of the Boost steering committee. He's happiest when finding powerful, elegant and efficient abstractions for complicated code and firmly believes code can and should be fast and beautiful. What you don't know about Eric, because this was the official part, unofficially, he spent over two years traveling solo without a fixed address and he was consulting remotely from tropical beaches. He gave that up though and now he's a husband dad, an employee, employee, a homeowner, and is very happy. So, introducing the Rangers TS, let's make some noise for happy, fast, and beautiful Eric Nibbler. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Um, so, who? Uh, a Polish friend of mine told me uh, not to expect a uh, rapturous uh, acceptance uh, in uh, Poland uh, because that's not how Polish people are. Um, but that's not my been, been my experience. Uh, you guys have been really, really friendly. Uh, so thank you uh, for making me feel so welcome here in Poland. So I'm told that this is mostly a C++ conference, um, but uh, you know, there's probably some JavaScript people, some Rust people, um, and uh, maybe something else. You know, uh, so uh, I won't take too much for granted. Um, I am going to be talking probes mostly about the the ranges TS for those who aren't so dialed into C++ standardization. TS stands for Technical Specification. It's uh, kind of a separate uh, standalone uh, standard that is shipped along with the C++ standard. It's not an official part of the standard, not yet at least, but we're working on that. So uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Ranges TS as it uh, has been sent for publication. And I'm going to be talking uh, the rest of my time about all the things that are going to be coming after the Ranges TS, things that are I'm working on right now, things that I have ideas about, things that other people have ideas about. Um, and so we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about the future, um, which is very exciting. I know the, um, the uh, synopsis of this talk doesn't really say that, but uh, when I wrote that synopsis, it was before all this cool stuff started happening. Um, so uh, I had to change it up a little bit because I was so excited to tell you guys about what's going on. This is when I started working on the range's technical specification. A blog post that I wrote on my website, October 13th, 2000, uh, October 13th, 2013. So that was the ranges dot begin, right? And uh, when does it end? You guys are the first to know the range's technical specification will officially be published, I'm told, in less than a week on November 20th, 2017. So. Very excited about that. So four years of my life spent getting this document out the door. You might wonder, like, why are you spending this much time working on this technical specification? Um, and the reason is because I'm, I like C++. I don't necessarily think it's the greatest language. I hope we're not programming it 50 years from now. Um, but uh, it so happens that C++ is one of the most heavily used industrial programming languages in the world, and its standard library kind of sucks. I want to make the C++ standard library better, and that turns out to be really easy, um, because it has so far to go. Uh, what I like is really cool, very beautiful, very composable abstractions, and that's what I think we're going to get with ranges. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what ranges are and what's in the ranges technical specification. Oops. Oh, okay. What's in the ranges TS? 
concepts. The range's technical specification is built on top of another technical specification called the concepts TS. Concepts are a way to let you say in code what the type requirements are for your generic programs, your templates. So we've got primitive uh, concepts, iterator concepts, callable concepts, and of course range concepts, because it is the range's TS after all. You get a couple of uh, iterators that work really well with these concepts and algorithms, the move iterator, common iterator, and counted iterator. And you get all of the algorithms that are in the standard template library, uh, but in two different flavors. Iterator-based, as we all know and love, and range-based. So, when will my vendor start shipping an implementation? Who knows? Um, nobody's shipping one yet. Talking with the GCC team right now to uh, possibly ship our reference implementation, and so that might happen sooner rather than later, but you know, the lawyers need to fight that out. Okay, if you wanted to get it right now, what you could do is go to GitHub and grab my range v3 library, which is an implementation of something very much like the range's TS, except written uh, in C++11 as opposed to C++14 plus concepts. And it works on any compliant C++11 compiler. Unfortunately, that doesn't include Microsoft's. You can also get the reference implementation of the range's technical specification, which is actually writ written in the dialog of C++ that actually has concepts in it. And you could find that here in uh, Casey Carter's um, GitHub repo. Uh, he's my co-author. And uh, this is very high fidelity to the range's technical specification and um, bug fixes. You can also get a version of Range V3 that works uh, with VS Visual Studio 2015. Uh, this, was a this is a very out-of-date port of Range V3. Um, they cloned it about three, uh, two years ago and then hacked it to pieces. Uh, so the experience is not going to be so great. Uh, and also, it's got lots of bugs. Uh, send complaints and bug reports to Microsoft, please, because this is I don't maintain this code. OK. So, the philosophy of the range is TS. Iterators must go. No, actually, uh, that's not true. Sorry, Andre, if you've seen Andre's talk about iterators must go. Um, iterators are a fundamental abstraction. The STL uh, uses iterators to great effect. Um, and I don't think anyone is interested in throwing away the community's investment in the iterator abstraction. So ranges are actually a layer on top of iterators. I believe that the notion of position is totally fundamental. You can't write generic algorithms without any notion of position. So iterators have to stay. And operations on iterators are a far more powerful basis than operations on ranges, just because they give you that power to express position. OK. So Andre's point in his iterators must go talk was that ranges uh, are much cleaner, higher level abstraction, and if you have to muck about with iterators, then your code is going to be buggier. By and large, that's true. Um, sometimes you need to get down into the guts, uh, and it's uh, really a pain if you don't have a way to do that. Uh, and a lot of the extra complexity can mostly be hidden at the library level. And that's what ranges is. So what is a range? I've been talking a lot about ranges. Um, a range is basically anything that has a begin method and an end method, where begin returns an iterator, and end returns, well, in today's STL, things that look like ranges return, uh, the end returns an iterator also. Um, but in the ranges TS, uh, we make some slight changes. End actually can return something called a sentinel. It doesn't necessarily have to have the same type as begin, as long as they are comparable. So there are sub uh, uh, sub concepts, these are concepts, sub-concepts underneath range, the proper terminologies, these, these concepts subsume range. There's container, containers have order n copy, views have order one copy, these are usually very lightweight uh, reference -y sorts of things, and a sized range is a range that can give you its size in order one. forgot to say in the beginning, 
I really like taking questions in the middle of talks. If anyone has any question at any point, uh, please just shout me down. I can't actually see hands, so, so don't rely on me seeing your hand. Just say, hey, dude, or Eric, or question, or whatever. Or get this guy's attention and he'll give you a microphone and ask me a question. I love interactive talks. Okay. So, if you are used to programming in C++ uh, STL, what is it like to then uh, program using the ranges TS? Well, here's an example. Say you have a vector of integers, and you want to sort the vector. Today you say vector, uh, std sort, vec.begin, vec.end. If you have used the STL, you've, you're probably fingers are sore from typing .begin, .end. Uh, and we'd like to clean that up a little bit. We'd just like to be able to say ranges sort vec. And with the ranges technical specification, that just works. And these two things are equivalent. Ranges, dot, ranges sort uh, will call dot .begin, dot .end for you and call. It's, it's pretty simple. It's nothing really. It's not rocket science. All standard algorithms have range-based overloads that dispatch to the iterator overloads. Okay? And when I say ranges colon, whoops. Oh, I made that change on the other slides. Okay, never mind. Uh, I'll just tell you in words. Uh, ranges colon colon here uh, in uh, the range v3 library, you'd write it just like that, ranges colon colon sort. In the ranges technical specification, the ranges namespace is under std colon colon experimental. Because it's still kind of experimental. Okay. So another thing that's in the, um, the ranges tec technical specification that isn't in uh, the standard template library is this notion of invocables. Say you have a data structure and it's got a Boolean member function on it called valid. You've got a vector of valids. And I want to find, I want to uh, find, uh, I want to evaluate this predicate on all of the uh, data objects in my vector. I could say all of vector.begin, vector.end, lambda, return a.valid. Are all of my data objects valid, right? Make sense? In the ranges TS, you don't have to write a lambda because member pointers are okay as function objects. So you just say ranges all of vec and then the address of the data uh, valid uh, data member. Okay? It's uh, nothing, again, not rocket science, it's just you know a nicety, nice to have. Now, projections. Sometimes you really want to uh, operate on maybe just a subset of the data or some transformation of the data. And projections let you give a, um, a lambda or an invocable that transforms the data on the fly while the algorithm is operating over your data. So here you might have, um, you know, find me some element in this vector of pairs where the first element is 42. Simple enough. In the ranges TS, you'd say find, notice it's find and not find if, find 42, but transform all of the elements by applying this transformation first. And again, invocables are okay here. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So I have some slides at the end if we have time, probably not. Um, where I can talk a little bit more about like why I added projections to the ranges technical specif specification. Okay, so sentinels, like I said earlier, range.begin does not necessarily have to return an object of the same type as range.end. It just has to return something that's quality comparable. So here's a simple example. Imagine you want to call an algorithm on a null terminated string. Right? You can't do this very easily in today's standard template library. You can do it, but you really have to shoehorn it. And, and if we take a, a larger view, uh, the, uh, the, standard template, uh, as, as the standard template library's algorithms work on you know, uh, uh, ranges denoted by two things of the same type. That describes, that can be used to describe a, a wide category of ranges, but it's not the only things that are interesting um, that you might want to operate on. For instance, you might denote a range by, uh, you know, from here and 
uh, n elements. You know, here's an iterator and here's a count of elements. Operate on this many elements starting here. So that's an interesting range type that is not easy to express uh, uh, as, as an argument to the standard template uh, library. And another would be like, okay, here is an, uh, an iterator and here's a predicate. Operate on all the elements until the predicate returns false. Okay, or true. So sentinels actually help you express these different uh, types of ranges and let you pass these ranges to the standard uh, algorithms. So here's an example, null terminator. I'm gonna define a comparison from a const char star to a null terminator. And it'll return true when we reach the null terminator. And you know, like John Lakos would want us to define all of the operators. And here's our find algorithm. Find is going to take a, um, an iterator, a sentinel. Now imagine sentinel is a null terminator and your iterator is a char star, right? And you're gonna find a value. You're going to iterate your iterator until first is not equal to last. So you're gonna walk through your null terminated string until you reach the null terminator. You apply the algorithm to the null terminated string. And this is gonna generate very efficient code. Okay, but here's where I expect uh, John Lakos to jump up on the stage and throw me off because uh, this is a gross misappropriation of syntax. Equality here does not mean they represent the same value. This is kind of a dirty hack uh, and if John is here, whew, yeah. yeah. Incidentally, notice how different John looks now, right? He's lost a lot of weight, yeah. So, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm also sorry to Alex Stepanoff, um, who uh, likewise, if he were not retired, would probably come find me and, and kill me. Okay, but uh, the long and short of it is, it's, it's an engineering trade-off. Um, by allowing the type of the end iterator to differ from the begin, we give the optimizer more context, resulting in better code gen, and we make it easier to write correct iterators. Okay. So, let me see. If, who here has actually used range v3 or knows anything about it? Some people, or read my blog. Uh, so you might have an idea of like, what's in the ranges ts, and you'll be sorely disappointed. What I just showed you, that's it, right? So all of the good stuff is not in the range's technical specification, and I'm sorry, but I just ran out of time. So all of the good stuff um, is stuff I'm gonna be talking about uh, now, which is all the stuff that's coming after the range's technical specification, some of which is under development um, presently. In particular, uh, this is the big one. Once you have ranges, you really want to be able to compose ranges. So you want to build lazy pipelines of transformations uh, over your data. So for instance, you really want to, the ability to say, I want to filter this range, and I want this to happen lazily and on demand as I traverse this range, filter out all of the elements uh, for which this predicate fails to return true. So drop all of the elements that are not even and print out 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, right? Here is another view. And what this does is it, it creates a range, it's a half open range, of all the integers from 0 through half open, so it's 9, okay? And all of these views are uh, implicitly convertible to things that look like containers. So I can create all a range, a lazy range of all of the integers from one to whatever, zero to whatever, and assign it to a container. That all works, fills in the container. And then I can uh, inc uh, filter all out all the evens. So, and as you might expect, this expression produces a range to which you can apply more filter transformations in a pipeline. So this gives you algorithms that compose, 
they evaluate lazily on demand as you iterate them. This is really like the bang for the buck. This is why you want ranges, because you want your standard library's components to compose nicely. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah, question. As I understand you right, uh, such uh, filter view and ITO is not uh, included in uh, technical specification right now. What is the reason? Why, why is this not in the technical specification? Uh, I tried to uh, get a, uh, the technical specification as small as possible to get it out the door. So the technical specification is, is just basic building blocks on which you can build things like this. Um, and, and I'm... I understand that people want the ranges and the range adapters. It's next on my list, and I'll talk about it in just a second, where we are in the process of standardizing those. Okay? Yeah. One more yeah. Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, my question is, you told about lazy initialization, but uh, it looks like that as far as you are assigning it to vector, it should be computed immediately at this point. So why you talk it that it's lazy? Right. So why, why did I say that this is lazy when clearly I am forcing the uh, immediate evaluation of it by assigning it to a vector? Well, if I were to... Oops. Back up. Okay. If I were to take view and I stuck it here, right? If view iota is here and I filter that, right, then I am only evaluating view iota as I iterate through it. So view iota is itself lazy. It's the assignment to a container that forces its immediate evaluation, right? I could generate an infinite list of integers using view iota just by leaving off the second parameter. Say I say I drop this ten. View iota zero. Infinite number of integers, until they overflow, of course, um, starting at zero. And then I could say pipe view take 10. And that will take the first 10 elements from that lazy view. So it really is a lazy view. I'm not generating eagerly you know, the, the inf an, an infinite number of integers. I'm really just lazy, lazily generating the, inter iterators, uh, the integers as you iterate through it. Does that make sense? Okay. So last week I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where the C++ standardization committee was meeting. And we were talking about uh, this paper that I brought, uh, which was um, the first round of standardization uh, for the range adapters. So it's really happening. Uh, uh, wasn't just, uh, you know, uh, blowing wind up your bottoms. Um, so, uh, this was actually very warmly received. Uh, people on the standardization committee have been eagerly anticipating this work also. Uh, so they uh, put a stamp of approval on it and they forwarded it off to the library working group who's going to actually look at the detailed wording. Um, but the design is approved uh, and we're moving forward with that. It includes some utilities, view interface and sub range, and a bunch of adapters. So we're getting IOTA and filter. We're going to get a transform, single, empty, reverse, take, join, split, counted, bounded. Those are all lazy. Um, so uh, it's exciting. Happy about this. This is, I don't know how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10, 10 of them. Um, the Range V3 library has over 40, so this is really just a small subset. And this paper weighs in at over 70 pages. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, getting the whole lot in the standard library is going to take some time working on it. More to come. But that's not all the interesting stuff that's going on right now. Um, so there's some really cool work that I really want to share with you. This is not work that I'm doing. It's work that another team is doing. Uh, but it's based on ranges. And it's uh, parallel ranges. In particular, it's an application of the ranges concepts to heterogeneous computing, particularly on uh, the GPU. So there's a sec separate technical specification called the Parallelism TS. Parallelism TS contains a whole bunch of algorithms that you can pass an execution policy to that says, I want this 
algorithm executing in parallel, or I want you to use vector instructions, or some combination of the two. Which is great, um, because if you are processing a truly enormous amount of data, you really want to be able to parallelize it. You know, we've got, we've got threads, we've got SIMD instructions, we should be able to use them from standard C++, so now we can. Here's what it would look like. You'd say you'd have a, a vector, you'd make a really terrifically huge vector of integers, and you'd say, sort it in parallel, please. Great, that's easy. The parallelism TS unfortunately has some shortcomings. You really want to be able to execute your, uh, your uh, algorithms on the GPU. Why do you want to execute your algorithms on the GPU, anybody? About how much of your uh, average desktop compute power is in the GPU? It, it's, it's, it's over 80% of your, of your uh, compute power is on the GPU, and in standard C++, you have no way to get access to that 80% of your compute power, which is embarrassing because C++ is a systems programming language which should give you access to the hardware, and it doesn't. And unfortunately, the parallelism TS gives you no way, no standard way, to say, I want this to execute on the GPU, please. It leaves the door open. Implementers are free to, impl to define their own executors, but there's none that's required. So that is kind of awful. And even if there were a GPU execution policy, the interface forces a data round trip to the GPU for each algorithm. Why? Algorithms in this STL don't compose. So the parallelism TS is great if you can express your entire program logic as a single call to one algorithm. How many people write their programs this way? Nobody, right? If you've ever done GPU programming, you know the first thing you have to do is you have to get your data to the GPU, right? So you call an algorithm, you say, I want this executed on the GPU. Oh, the G Fine, copy all the data over to the GPU, run this parallel sort or whatever on the GPU, copy all the data back. You're like, great, now I want to make all the data unique. Okay, all the data back to the GPU to, to, to make it unique and then send it all back. Okay, great, you want to do something else, right? Okay, you get the idea. This is not an ideal interface. <laughs> Parallel algorithms don't compose. As someone who does a lot of uh, high-profile work with committee, um, people send me ideas in email quite a lot. Um, sometimes they're good ideas. Most often they're kind of crackpot uh, ideas that you know people shooting from the hip, not really thinking the problem all the way through. Um, but when someone sends me a uh, academic paper, then I really pay attention because you don't get published in an academic journal unless you really think the problem through. And so someone sent me this academic paper last year towards composable GPU programming. GPUs, programming GPUs with eager actions and lazy views. And this paper was entirely about my range v3 library and how it's great for heterogeneous computing on the GPU, which totally blew my mind because I had no idea when I wrote the range library that it had any relevance to heterogeneous computing at all. So what they say in our approach, programmers obtain full control to either use patterns expressed as STL algorithms and actions which are computed eagerly on the GPU, or use views, which our implementation guarantees to fuse during code generation and execute in a single GPU kernel. This really blew my mind, this paper. So here's how it works. Say you want to compute the dot product of two vectors, you can lazily, you copy the data, you lazily zip it, you can transform it using any sort of transform that you want, and then you reduce it. And this whole thing gets fused and executes all together on the GPU all at once. Any number of view adapters can get piped together sent as input to a GPU algorithm, and all of it executes all at once, all together. 
no da data round tripping. They achieve some really impressive performance wins doing this. So this graph shows uh, percent speed up relative to hand optimized GPU code. So this, let me show you what you're seeing here. This uh, y axis is speed up. This is the size of your data set. Like you can see, it gets truly large. This one here is this hand coded uh, CUDA optimized code that actually ships as part of the NVIDIA STK. So it, this is not just some yokel writing this code, this is NVIDIA engineers. That code is shipped in the SDK. And this is how, this is how the ranges implementation scales, right? This is for, the red is for the dot product algorithm that I just showed you. And orange is for a different algorithm. This is a summation algorithm up here. And you can ignore these two lines down here. They're for another technology called thrust, which doesn't scale as well. Um, the important bit here is that ranges above a certain size of data is exactly on par or even better than handcrafted CUDA GPU code written by NVIDIA engineers. Like, wow, oh, that's amazing. And if you looked at the code here, there's, there's, if anyone's written GPU code uh, using CUDA or OpenCL, it's kind of horrible. You have all of this like special gunk in there uh, that's you know, not standard C++. This is all standard C++. Composes beautifully. So I forwarded that paper to a guy I know on the committee. His name is uh, Michael Wong. He's currently working at uh, GitHub, I mean, uh, uh, at CodePlay. And uh, he's very interested in uh, making heterogeneous computing in standard C++ suck less. Right? And he's very interested uh, in working with these guys. And they already have a, uh, uh, some uh, experimental code that you can go uh, look at and play with on, on GitHub. And it's uh, all built on top of, it's a range layer built on top of their uh, Sickle uh, uh, technology, which is, uh, is kind of um, pure C++ extensions on top of OpenCL. So they're going to be bringing a paper forward to the C++ standardization committee. It's very exciting work. OK. Programming for the GPU can be declarative, composable, and as efficient as hand-optimized, low-level, GPU-specific algorithms. So this is really cool. And this is the power of a really nice, clean, simple abstraction. OK. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, ranges and coroutines. So who is aware that there is a thing coming in C++ called coroutines? Uh, maybe a third of the room? OK. So I might have to say just a little bit about coroutines. There's a coroutines technical specification. It was sent for publication at the same time that the ranges technical specification was. So it should probably be officially published any day now. And if you've used a programming language like, uh, like C Sharp, then you know about a sync and a wait. Um, coroutines are a way to get the same thing in C++. Uh, but uh, it's actually more powerful than that. There's nothing inherently asynchronous about coroutines, but you can use them together with uh, a thread pool and a simple scheduler to get something like asynchronous behavior uh, using a sync and a wait. And in fact, it introduces new keywords uh, for um, awaitables. It's very exciting stuff. You can like do, write mind-bending code using coroutines. Um, but my point here is that it actually interacts really nicely with ranges. No. OK, whoops, too much. OK, lightweight cooperative multitasking. Right. So these are the new keywords that it gives you. It gives you co-await, co-yield, and co-return. And why co? Because, you know, legacy C++ makes it hard to add new keywords without breaking millions of lines of code. And so since the coroutines TS uh, was published like pretty much now, uh, and we're a few years out before we get to C++20. It's a plausible addition for C++20, assuming nothing goes too horribly wrong. 
but I'm not one to make predictions, particularly not about the future. Uh, okay, the nice thing about coroutines, as with uh, C sharp, uh, iter iterables, and also um, generators in Python, makes it really, really easy to build a range of things. So for instance, here's a type that somebody wrote using coroutines called generator int. And here's where you could find the implementation of that. Generator. So I can loop over all of the integers, and I can yield each integer in turn. And this thing, generator, is going to be a range. Great. And the semantics are when I yield something, suspend, suspend the state of my coroutine. That is, all the local variables get flash frozen in place, and you actually return control to the caller. The caller will have a handle to this coroutine squirreled away in the return object, the generator. And so when you move to the next element in the, uh, in the, in the range, you pick up execution of the coroutine where you left off, which means right after the co-yield. So you'll go back to the top of the loop, you'll increment the iterator, you'll yield another integer, and then you will flash freeze the state of your coroutine again and return control back to your caller. Okay. And so, you know, this is an infinite sequence of, of integers. It, like I said, it returns a range, which means that you can do all sorts of rangey things to the return value, including, say, take 10 elements from my infinite range of integers and print them. Sure. OK. Any questions about this? It's, it's a lot like concepts that you've seen from other programming languages. So in some sense, C++ is playing catch up here. OK. So what if you wanted to produce an algorithm that filters ranges uh, using coroutines? Well, it's pretty trivial, actually. Um, oops, wrong button. So this is concepts, if, uh, if you guys haven't seen concepts before. I can require that certain types have certain properties. And I'm requiring here that this parameter passed in is an input range. And that this thing is a predicate that operates on elements of this range. OK. So now that this algorithm is properly constrained, I know that these things are going to succeed. And I could loop over all of the elements in my range, and I can evaluate the predicate on each element. If the predicate returns true, I yield it. Now I've just filtered my range. This is pretty simple. And now I can filter my infinite sequence using a predicate, and I get all the evens out of that. OK, that's nice. So my point here, showing this code, there's actually nothing asynchronous here about this code whatsoever. This is just a plain old generator. Entirely synchronous code, just like any range is. But gosh, it makes it so clean and so easy to do range sorts of range transformations. So coroutines are really nice in that way. OK. But. Like I said, that was all synchronous, and synchronous is well and good, but sometimes you really want asynchrony. You want to be able to do things concurrently. So how do you get concurrency with uh, coroutines and with ranges? And when you mix these two things together, coroutines, asynchrony, uh, asynchrony, and ranges, you get some really interesting stuff. And this is the stuff that I've been spending most of my time thinking about lately. So the coroutines TS defines a new kind of for loop. It's an asynchronous for loop. You can for co-await on whatever this thing is, and it probably something that looks like a range but isn't quite. So what happens? What is this code equivalent to? It's kind of equivalent to this. So I want to move to the first element of this range. But I want to wait for the result, which means I want to suspend my coroutine. Like, 
wake me up when the first element arrives. That's what this means, right? And then grab the end of the range and then increment through the iterator and then await for each successive element. That is, you wait for the first element and you wait for successive elements. And what this does is this turns your algorithm inside out. That is, instead of pulling elements out of this range, it is, wake me up when the next element is available. It turns pull into push. So it makes sense? Okay. Well, that suggests that there's a range concept here. There's a concept very much like a range, but it's not quite a range because these things, you know, have awaitable operations in them. So if you go digging through the range of the concepts technical specification, you see that the result of uh, the await operation is the return value of this function, await resume on whatever thing you're awaiting. Okay, so we can write a little meta function that's like, give me the return type of co-await on this expression. Okay. Now I can define something called an asynchronous iterator. This is a concept, and this is what a concept definition looks like. I say, it's a readable thing. That means I can dereference it to read a value. It's a semi-regular thing, which means I can copy and move it with regular semantics. This would make John Lakos very happy. And here's the requires, required expressions on this iterator. I can increment it and await resume. I can call co-await on the result of incrementing the iterator, and that better return me the same type as I passed in, okay? And I could also post-increment it because iterators are post-incrementable too. Okay. So then I can define an asynchronous input range as when I call the iterator type of this range is something that I can await on, and when I await on it, I get something that is an async input iterator. I can also call end on it, and this is the type of end, the sentinel type, and I can compare that thing to the iterator type. And in code now, I have said what an asynchronous range is. This is in, t in code the requirements on those things that can uh, be uh, looped over with a for co-await. Okay. And now that I've defined what that concept is, I can program to the concept. I can write generic algorithms that accept asynchronous ranges, and I can write asynchronous algorithms that operate on those ranges. So here is find again that takes asynchronous input iterator, right? It's constrained now. And here is the range-based version of that algorithm. Pass me something that is an asynchronous, here it's an asynchronous view, that is something that is copyable in order one, and a value, and co-return the result of calling find on co-await begin and value. What that means is this is an algorithm that executes inside out as the data shows up. Okay. Great. So once we have this concept, an asynchronous range, we can define a set of asynchronous views over asynchronous ranges. So for instance, the filter view, the transform view, every sort of filter uh, view that you could possibly want. We can define those on asynchronous ranges just as easily as we can define them on synchronous ranges. So now we can imagine that we can filter and transform an infinite asynchronous sequence of network packets or user interface events mouse movements, keyboard input, whatever, right? File system notifications, whatever. On-demand computation. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Anything like this? People have programmed like this before? No? 
publisher and subscriber kind of programming. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's a simple algorithm that uh, subscribes, processes, and unsubscribes to a stream of data. So I call it consume n. It's going to consume a bunch of data from a stream. So here's an observable, which is something I can subscribe to. This is an asynchronous stream of data. And I can subscribe to that observable and get back a range, an asynchronous range, and a handle to the producer. And I can loop over all the elements of the range. I can filter that. I can apply any sort of view transformation that I want to this. It's all happening asynchronously. So when the data shows up, execution happens. I could do the work on the element. I can break at whatever period I want to break, and then I can unsubscribe from the producer and disconnect from the source. Okay. This is reactive programming. So coroutines plus ranges equals reactive programming. And it's beautiful, and it's simple, and it's powerful. All right? We don't have to turn our code inside out to write our reactive designs. We can just write a straight line code with for loops, whatever, like as we always do. And we can make it totally asynchronous and reactive. So that's pretty exciting. So coroutines make it trivial to define lazily evaluated views of data sequences. The ratios TS provides algorithms that make operating on views easy. Ranges can be asynchronous. Algorithms and views that are asynchronous, we can write generic code that's either imperative or reactive, depending on the input. Same code. Pull-based, push-based, it's all the same thing. Great, that's what I've got. I'm happy to take questions. I also have more slides at the end, if you guys are keen to stick around. Thank you, Eric. I very much believe that... Uh... Yeah, why not? Come on. No. It's one of many uh, uh, applauses that you're going to get uh, today. Uh, I think we've got some questions online. Could I have it, please? Okay, one question online is... What ranges didn't make it to C++ 17? So what ranges didn't make it? So unfortunately, there is uh, no range support in C++ 17. Um, concepts missed the boat. Uh, that was kind of a contentious uh, vote on the committee. Uh, and since the ranges TS is uh, based on concepts, it couldn't go out the door without concepts. So uh, the good news, is that uh, a large subset of the concepts TS has already been merged into C++20. So, barring Armageddon, uh, which has happened before, we are going to get concepts in C++20, and uh, then the, uh, the push is going to be on to get something like the ranges TS into C++20 also. Um, and a uh, slight diversion on, on this, uh, talk a little bit about the future of the C++ standard library. Um, you can't really add concepts to the standard library as it is today, because it would break too much code. Uh, concept checking, unfortunately, is a very hard thing to uh, kind of uh, reverse engineer onto your programs. So what is probably going to happen is we are probably going to see a fork in the C++ standard library. Um, right now we have namespace std. We're probably going to see an awful lot of the ranges TS show up in namespace std2, maybe. That's uh, to be decided. Um, but the ranges TS is going to be the basis for a uh, complete reimagining of the C++ standard library that will be shipped uh, separately uh, in a different namespace. Yeah, okay, so uh, my question is that um, composing range views looks like a lot um, like C Sharp's link. Do you know it and have any comment? How does it compare? So a lot of people have told me that it looks a lot like link. Um, 
and I suppose that's not surprising because uh, Link is inspired by uh, the same things that uh, inspired me, which is uh, functional programming. So uh, uh, I would say I, I don't actually know Link very well. Um, I've done a little bit of C Sharp, very little bit. Um, uh, but uh, the, the similarities are, are probably just like I said, because you know, they, they both come from the same uh, source material. Hi, um, we use continue, continuable futures at work, and one thing we needed was a timeout on the wait. Is it possible with curtains? Yes, um, so uh, timeout is totally possible with coroutines. Coroutines, uh, in fact, there's, there's no semantics associated with C++ coroutines, none whatsoever. You get keywords, and you get to say how that keyword, those keywords lower into your library code, so you get all of the hooks uh, to do whatever you want. Uh, and if you want your coroutine to schedule things on, say, a UI event loop, you can code that. You can write all of that stuff. You can pass in an executor that represents a handle to a bunch of I.O. thread pools, to, a, to an I.O. thread pool. And you can uh, schedule a timeout or a notification um, on that thread pool. And then you can be notified when that timer goes off. You can cancel operations, whatever you want to do. So you have uh, complete control uh, as the author of a, um, uh, a type returned by a coroutine. That's the good news. The bad news is that none of these abstractions exist yet. People haven't actually written, you know, nobody has proposed anything to the standard library that uses these hooks to implement any of this really cool essential functionality. So what we are given is like a bunch of parts and told that we can build any kind of hot rod out of them that we want. Right now, you need to know how to do your own hot rodding. And it's not easy, I can tell you. Um, so what we need right now are really smart people who can build something like that on top of coroutines and then deliver those abstractions uh, to the world through their GitHub, and then propose it to the C++ standard library so everyone can benefit. No. Okay, first of all, C++ is going to be so awesome, and you're awesome. But, yeah, thank you. Uh, now to be uh, a little bit of an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> um, what is the error handling strategy for ranges, especially in the example where you're pushing a composition of ranges to the GPU? So error handling on the GPU. Uh, I think I might have mentioned that uh, that was like a separate team doing that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. Honestly, no clue. Um, or even propagation through the reactive interface. Right, uh, so that's, prop that's propagation of errors through examples. reactive and, and particularly through coroutines is really an interesting topic. So you can throw exceptions in a coroutine. And as an author of a coroutine type, uh, that is the type that gets returned from a coroutine, you have to, you are required to define a function called unhandled exception, which gets called when an exception escapes your coroutine. You have an option to then capture that exception and ferry it to wherever that object will be consumed so that you then have a chance to propagate it later. Or you might just decide to swallow the exception or you might decide to terminate your process. Or So basically what I'm saying is with coroutines, you can do whatever error handling makes you the happiest. Okay, so, so if I were to... Uh swallow the exception, how transparent is that to the optimizer? Can it just, you know, take away the, the, th the throw site? Can it see, th well, I guess that would depend on context. So, so uh, and I, uh, this is a very interesting topic too. I've been doing a lot of work trying to figure out how to optimize the code generation of exceptions. Uh, what I've noticed is that um, compilers do a terrible job optimizing exception code. <laughs> Uh, particularly if you uh, try to uh, ferry an exception from one place to another so you can rethrow it later. That involves dynamic allocation and type erasure. 
uh, and then catching and rethrowing, forget about it. Your performance is out the window. Um, but if in your unhandled exception, you do nothing, you don't save the exception, you don't try to rethrow it later, you just swallow it. Code generation is amazing. It's as if the error never happened, because it essentially didn't, right? Um, I'm not saying do that, right? Because that's not how you build reliable systems. Um, what I think uh, is going to happen is uh, we're gonna change how coroutines are defined. I've already talked uh, to Gore about this. Um, to make it possible to not have to save the exception off so you could rethrow it later, if you just let the exception bubble out, the code generation is way better. Uh, and it'll be even better if we coach people when you're writing asynchronous code, maybe exceptions are not the best strategy. So probably what we'll see as people use coroutines to write high performance systems is that they get uh, more used to using things like um, error handling strategies that have more monadic sorts of compositions, things like um, uh, uh, not even a system error, something like uh, uh, optional uh, or something like um, uh, the, there's a proposal for uh, expected, which is if you use uh, Haskell, there's the either monad. So I know that in this group, maybe monad is a dirty word. But um, the either monad is coming to the C++ standard library, which would be a much better way of reporting errors out of a coroutine. It would generate much better code. Okay, we've got one question over here and then one uh, from the website. Okay. Uh, so, uh, are you in touch uh, with uh, Vincent Botet, who's working on uh, product types, which is basically iterating over uh, class members when developing ranges? Are these two compatible, or at least is there any communication going on? No, I haven't. Uh, I know who you're talking about, uh, and I've seen his name quite a lot but I haven't been in communication with Vincent at all about what he's working on, so um, maybe you could talk to me afterwards and let me know if there's something I should know. Uh, the question from the website is, uh, there are several actually, is there a difference between the C++ async for loop and observable known from .NET or JS reactive extensions? Right. So. There's a reason why I called it observable on my slide, because uh, the correspondence is practically one-to-one, -one, and the thing that I'm uh, probably going to be devoting the next uh, year or so of my life to is building uh, a React-like library in C++ on top of coroutines and asynchronous ranges. So uh, the answer is no, there's no difference. This is what we're doing. Coroutines and ranges give us the perfect way to do React in C++. Another one is, are ranges potentially compatible with product types iterating over class members being worked on by Vincent Botet? <laughs> if the class members are heterogeneous, then no. Uh, a range is uh, uh, a list of uh, homogeneous values. So you can't use a range to iterate over a set of heterogeneous values, which is what a product type is. Sorry. And I've got one more, which I think uh, would serve very nicely as the last question in this session. I like your haircut. What do you do to keep it that way? Ah, yeah. So I have a very small set of travel clippers that I go everywhere with, and I. It's great. It takes just a double A battery, and yeah. I. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eric. Before you go, uh, just uh, several outstanding points. First of all, uh, I'll ask the audience to do one thing, and then my request to you would be. Could you please, after you come back, tell your Polish friend that she or he has been proven wrong <laughs> by this sort of reaction?
Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it going to be good enough for him or her? I think so, yeah. <laughs> good. It's terrific. <laughs> One thing that I saw in your slide, the one you talked about CUDA, mm -hmm. just, just um, it might interest you that we have a word in Polish that is spelt the same way and it means miracles. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Yeah. Thanks.